A unique sighting in Beijing, a black swan appears in Tiananmen Square, the center of the city, and a metaphor often associated with the bird's presence is stirring speculation. A Hong Kong actor says he is giving up his Canadian citizenship. Some call it a show of loyalty toward China's communist regime. Beijing bans men it deems aren't masculine enough for TV and labels them girly guns. Britain's new aircraft carrier arrives in Japan for a permanent military presence in the Indo-Pacific region. This is countering China's territorial claims. And two Canadians held in Chinese prison for more than 1,000 days. Their supporters rally in Ottawa. The two Michaels were accused of spying. This in a case that soured diplomatic ties between Canada and China. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. First, a unique sighting in Beijing. A black swan visited Tiananmen Square in the city center over the weekend. It caught the attention of nearby tourists. Animal conservationists removed the bird after a couple of hours. Some said the swan might have flown in from a nearby park. The incident triggered heated discussions among netizens. As Chinese leader Xi Jinping mentioned a black swan earlier this year, he cautioned people to be prepared for unexpected events that usually come with significant negative consequences. These are known as black swan events. The place the black swan landed carries deep historic significance for the Chinese people. In 1989, students and citizens across China protested against corruption in the Chinese Communist Party, demanding democracy and freedom. Tiananmen Square was the center of the demonstrations. But the Chinese military crushed the movement, killing hundreds or more protesters and arresting thousands. The clampdown has since remained one of Beijing's most widely censored topics. The Chinese Communist Party's recent crackdowns on the entertainment industry may be scaring Chinese celebrities. Hong Kong actor Nicholas Tse holds a dual citizenship, but now says he's renouncing his Canadian citizenship, keeping only his Hong Kong citizenship. Over the weekend, in an interview with Chinese state-run media outlet CCTV, he explained he's in the process of applying to give up his Canadian citizenship. He says he was born in Hong Kong, so he was originally a Chinese citizen. Concerns are rising in China that holding a dual citizenship may be viewed as unpatriotic or disloyal to the communist regime. Beijing is making it known that it expects men to be macho, and now it's trying to make that happen with a new order. Authorities last week banned effeminate celebrities from all media in China, saying broadcasters must resolutely put an end to sissy men and other abnormal aesthetics. It used an insulting slang term for these men, niang pao, or literally girly guns. The order comes as Beijing tightens its control over the entertainment industry in an effort to ramp up popularity of the country's TV and streaming shows. Mainland Chinese citizens tell NTD that touring companies are not giving them refunds. Many such companies have announced bankruptcy due to the CCP's recent clampdown on the sector. They are unable to provide tutoring services, but they are not returning parents' money. NTD's Don Ma has more. The CCP's recent crackdowns on China's tutoring industry has made it difficult for companies to continue their operations. More than 150,000 have announced bankruptcy. One major Chinese tutoring company of 27 years, Giant Education, issued a statement announcing that it can no longer provide teaching services. On top of that, it said that it's unable to refund parents who already paid tuition fees. Thousands of parents have reportedly tried to get refunds from the company. One parent tells NTD that she tried everything to get her money back, but to little use. We gave her a pseudonym to protect her identity. The amount of refund money people are asking for ranges from a few hundred yuan to hundred thousand yuan. I estimate that the total money involved in this case is in the millions. But they just won't refund the money. No one is monitoring the situation. We reported it to all relevant departments. Ms. Gu says this experience made her feel that there is no rule of law under the CCP. Because there's no regulatory authority that requires the company to return the money to the parents. Then any company can do this. The society is just like this. And there's no rule of law at all. It seems some tutoring companies deliberately swindled parents. 
Some accuse Shanghai's Qi Wen education of this. A few days before the company announced bankruptcy, it was still reportedly taking in parents' tuition fees. Some parents said that just a day before the company closed down, they transferred money to the company. The boss of Qi Wen still praised the payments. In reality, at this point, he already knew that he was just going to take the money and run away. We parents think that he purposely engaged in fraud. Ms. Song says that parents have reported this to all relevant departments, including the Education Bureau, but none of the officials have established a case. She says the parents are at a loss for what to do. Don Ma, NTD News. One city in southern China is back under lockdown. That's after restrictions were removed for just one day. Following the area's previous shutdown, Yangzhou City initially shut its doors and businesses in late July, responding to a new wave of the pandemic in the area. Residents in its downtown area have endured a whopping 20 rounds of mass virus testing. But now complaints are rising. A poll shows nearly 90 percent of locals feel dissatisfied or extremely dissatisfied with the city's control measures. The sudden policy change has also backed up roads. Cars and trucks headed out of the city are stuck on the highway, waiting in hours-long lines to leave. Now the city remains closed once again, and locals still need a permit in order to enter the city's main area. An asymptomatic case is reported in South China. The city of Guangzhou is once again on high alert. Large crowds wait in line at night for mass testing. Some say the authorities are profiting from pandemic measures. A new virus patient has been confirmed in southern China's Guangzhou city. The discovery has triggered a widespread round-the-clock wave of virus testing in the area. The infected patient is asymptomatic, a woman in her 40s. She works in a quarantine facility for international travelers called Tokai Hotel in the city's downtown area. It's densely populated and filled with office buildings, residential communities, business centers and schools. The city immediately announced a local lockdown in response to the discovery. Officials are now urging residents to cooperate with the new wave of tests and restrictions, though locals are concerned about the measure. With China's traditional moon festival drawing near, many are upset that they won't be able to celebrate with their families. Some have called the measures extreme. A comment posted to social media on the topic reads, All this just because of one case? It's a wonder that the economy and people alive hasn't gotten ruined by it. While another user replied, How can they generate income amid this disease control without an excuse? As of Monday, a second round of massive tests is going on in areas around 10 major roads in the city and is expected to reach larger areas. The Chinese Communist Party's attempts at stealing foreign technology aren't slowing down. According to leaked documents obtained by the Epoch Times, hundreds of talented foreign experts have been recruited by the regime to work in China. The Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, calls this recruitment program the Thousand Talents Plan. It seeks out foreign talents who can be foreigners or Chinese people living overseas. The CCP then gets them to work for China by offering various incentives and benefits. The newly leaked document comes from city authorities in Senxi province, dated from March this year. It reveals that nearly 250 foreign talents were recruited in 2020. These experts specialize in fields like networking, artificial intelligence and microchips. Even staff from the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics have been recruited. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has warned that the Thousand Talents Plan is a means for Beijing to steal foreign technology and intellectual property. He says it's a plan to recruit scientists and professors to transfer the know-how we have here to China in exchange for enormous paydays. The FBI has arrested and prosecuted many that took part in the program. Last year, the bureau charged a former GE engineer with economic espionage and theft of GE's trade secrets. While the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas removed a number of scientists that had ties to the Thousand Talents Plan. Since 2018, the FBI has increased its arrests and prosecutions of Thousand Talents scholars. Chinese regime leader Xi Jinping has announced a plan for a new stock exchange. This one will be in Beijing. It comes at a time when Chinese companies are facing more and more hurdles to raise money in the U.S. And it is Evelyn Lee has more. 
Xi Jinping, the head of the Chinese Communist Party, said Thursday that Beijing will set up a stock exchange. It will serve small and medium-sized enterprises. The China Securities Regulatory Commission, or CSRC, says it will complement the Shanghai and Shenzhen stock exchanges. According to Xi, it's to support the innovation-driven development of SMEs. This comes at a time when Chinese companies have to deal with increasing regulatory hurdles in the U.S. trying to raise money. On top of that, Chinese authorities are upset about tech firms going public overseas because it could give data to foreign governments. Companies looking to list outside of China now need to be reviewed by the regime first. The CSRC says that the new exchange is also an important measure to deepen structural reform of the financial supply side. So far, the Chinese regime's regulatory crackdown on large private companies has wiped $3 trillion from the market. China piloted a registration-based IPO system a while back, and it will be applied to the new exchange as well. The system requires companies to disclose even more about their operations. Evelyn Lee, NTD News. The parent company of Hong Kong's pro-democracy newspaper Apple Daily is liquidating its assets, and its board members will be stepping down. That's according to a stock exchange filing on Sunday. The company Next Digital shares were stopped from trading in June, and its bank accounts were frozen. That same month, its most well-known product, Apple Daily, was forced to shut, and the company's founder, Jimmy Lai, is behind bars. He was charged with violating Hong Kong's national security law. Seven senior editors and executives were also charged with similar crimes. Since mainland China imposed a national security law on Hong Kong in 2020, Hong Kongers' freedoms have been increasingly suppressed. Next Digital has been blocked from paying its expenses, including paying its staff. The board hopes that by liquidating, the company regulators will allow them to pay their creditors and former staff. One of the former directors of the company, Mark Simon, told Deutsche Welle it shows that when any media crosses the national security law's red line, Hong Kong's regime will bury it with large legal fees and a regulatory storm. A statement from Next Digital this weekend also thanked its readers, saying you trust the work of our reporters and you understand that a free society and a free market depend on the free flow of information. When freedom of speech is deprived, no other rights are safe. Supporters of two Canadians held in Chinese prisons for 1,000 days rallied on Sunday. The two Michaels are accused of spying, but their supporters demand their release. This in a case that has soured diplomatic ties between Ottawa and Beijing. Jason Albano reports. Hundreds of people gathered in a park in the Canadian capital, Ottawa, to mark the 1,000th day since China arrested two Canadians on spying charges, a case that has soured diplomatic ties between Ottawa and Beijing. The protesters demanded the release of businessman Michael Spaver and former diplomat Michael Coverig. Many carried banners and wore white shirts that read, Bring Them Home. Canada's foreign affairs minister also attended the rally and said that years had been cruelly stolen from the men and their families. The so-called two Michaels were detained in China in 2018, just days after the arrest of Meng Wanzhou on a warrant from the United States. She's the chief financial officer of Chinese tech giant Huawei. She was charged with misleading global banking company HSBC on Huawei's dealings with Iran, which could have led the bank to breach U.S. sanctions. Meng has repeatedly denied this and has been fighting her extradition from under house arrest in Vancouver. She now awaits a verdict after hearings for her extradition wrapped up last month. Beijing has denied that Meng and the Michaels were related. It also warned of unspecified consequences unless she was released. Last month, a Chinese court sentenced Spaver to 11 years in prison for espionage, while Kubrick's verdict has yet to be announced. Since Meng's arrest, China has also sentenced four Canadians to death over drug charges. U.S. border officers recently seized hundreds of counterfeit jewelry pieces that would have been worth more than $5 million had they been real. Customs and Border Protection says officers in Cincinnati, Ohio, found 450 counterfeit bracelets and rings in August. The fake jewelry arrived in two shipments from China and Hong Kong. One was headed to Florida, the other Mississippi, before being seized. The shipments also contained other jewelry that wasn't determined to be counterfeit. The agency says it's seen rapid growth of counterfeit goods because of online shopping sites. Handbags, wallets, apparel and jewelry are the most likely targets. 
Taiwan's getting more vaccine doses. Poland says it will donate 400,000 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine to Taiwan. Only around 5% of Taiwan's 24 million population are fully vaccinated. It has already received 6 million doses gifted by Japan and the U.S., enabling it to speed up an inoculation program. Poland says the donation is a reciprocal move after Taiwan gave medical equipment during the first wave. Taiwan says its vaccination efforts have been hampered by China, but Beijing denies any negative role. Taiwan has repeatedly rejected offers of doses from China, saying it has doubts about the safety of Chinese-made shots. Britain's new aircraft carrier, HMS Queen Elizabeth, arrives in Japan. The UK will have a permanent military presence in the Indo-Pacific region. That's as China's navy increasingly presses its territorial claims. NTD's Eddie Atkin brings us this report. Britain shows off its HMS Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier to Japan's defense minister on Monday. Nobu Akishi meets the strike group's commander, Commodore Steve Moorhouse, on board the carrier. Before arriving, the Queen Elizabeth held an exercise with warships from the US, Netherlands, Canada and Japan. And, and the visit to Japan is, is hugely important and symbolic for us. Um, I think the first time uh, since the late 1990s that a UK aircraft carrier has been alongside in Japan. And I, I think it's the best uh, evidence that you can see of our commitment um, to the Indo-Pacific region. The arrival of the £3 billion carrier starts a permanent British military presence in the Indo-Pacific. Two warships will stay in the region as London looks for a bigger world presence following Brexit. While docked near Tokyo, the Queen Elizabeth will help Britain drum up business deals, hosting executives from leading Japanese companies. The prominence of this region is rising significantly in terms of growing economies, etc. Um, certainly post-Brexit, the United Kingdom is looking to establish deals and relationships now uh, with a number of nations. And, and so the strike group is not just about hard power. Royal Navy officers explained to the Defence Minister and senior Japanese military commanders how stealth fighters launch from the ramp at the bow. Japan is seeking to expand its military cooperation beyond its traditional alliance with the US as China's navy expands and presses its territorial claims. Eddie Aitken, NTD News. A report warns against Britain's reliance on trade with China. It says the dependence is a threat to Britain's national security. Lobby group The Independent Business Network finds more than 50,000 types of products being imported are almost exclusively from China. This involves 28,000 British firms. The report says about two-thirds of vital products in the fight against COVID-19 are from China. These include ethanol disinfectants, diagnostic test kits, face masks, PPE and adhesive dressings. The group's chairman and a former director general of the British Chambers of Commerce called the scale of dependence on China frightening. He said China's growing presence in British industry is not just a threat to business, it is a threat to national security. The German ambassador to China died less than two weeks after arriving in China, and the German chancellor issued a statement expressing her condolences. Jan Hecker was a foreign policy advisor to Chancellor Angela Merkel before his appointment as ambassador to China. The German foreign minister told media the death is unrelated to Hecker's role as ambassador. Hecker officially started working at the end of August. According to German media, Hecker was one of Merkel's closest confidants. Hardly anyone in Berlin has had such a great influence on the Chancellor's foreign policy in recent years. He accompanied the Chancellor on almost all trips abroad. In recent years, perceptions of China have plummeted among the German public. But the government's China policy seemed not to keep pace. It still follows a policy of constant dialogue. Many observers assume that Merkel sent Hecker to Beijing in an effort to maintain her policy of constant dialogue even after her departure later this year. NTD's ninth international classical Chinese dance competition saw over a hundred contestants from all over the world, all taking the stage in New York. After four days of competition, 12 of them took home the gold. Let's take a look at the highlights. Before Sunday evening's award ceremony, gold medalists from previous years showcased some of the best techniques in classical Chinese dance. Strings of difficult jumps and tumbles from male dancers won rounds of applause. 
while the female dancers' graceful movements presented the elegance and gentleness of ancient Chinese women. This year, 12 contestants from the junior and adult divisions were honored with the top award. The competition aims to promote authentic Chinese culture, traditions that have nearly been lost, destroyed by the Chinese Communist Party over the past several decades. After winning, I just have a bigger responsibility to revive this culture. I'm really happy. I think it's an encouragement for me to continue the path of dancing. Now I know my direction better. I hope in the future I can bring to the audience more works that can inspire the goodness in them and that conveys beautiful messages. This year's gold medalist also brought a special dance component to the stage, a long-lost dance technique known as the body leads the hands and the hips leads the legs. The method teaches dancers that the power behind their movements comes from the center of the body. I feel like there's actually so much behind it and the more you go into it, the more interesting it gets. And then it just adds like so much to your dance. It's like a different world from like regular dance. On stage, the dancers portrayed some of the best-known figures in Chinese history, from talented scholars to loyal generals to great beauties in ancient China, presenting a concise version of the country's 5,000 years of civilization. The competition aims to foster cultural exchange and promote purely authentic traditional dance, bringing its purity and goodness to light. Many contestants came to the competition with the same aspiration. I hope to bring the most traditional Chinese classical dance to the world so that people around the world will know that classical dance is really good. What comes with winning gold is the responsibility to do better and to bring the highest art form I can to bring back this lost heritage to more people around the world. The contestants say they will continue pursuing new heights in their training to reach new levels in their artistic journeys. NTD News, New York. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.